All right, hey guys, what's going on? So today we are getting into quantizing spinner fields, right? So we talked about scalar fields, we talked about quantizing those, and from that we got creation and annihilation operators. Then we talked about uh, making complex uh, scalar fields, and when we added that level of complexity, we found out that we could sort of parse out uh, these operating fields, right, to uh, elucidate antiparticles. And then we uh, sort of, we sort of dove into those, we really dove into those <clears throat> to, and explored the Hamiltonian and the various different consequences of assessing what the Hamiltonian was like and what it did and what we found out was that there was a grand state energy um, for those fields. Now we're moving to spinner fields, and we're going to see that one of the consequences of spinner fields is the our beloved Pauli exclusion principle, something that you see in chemistry, uh, general chemistry, right? And we're going to actually do a deep dive into deriving the Pauli exclusion principle on a quantum field theory level in within the next two or three videos. For this video, I want to go over a brief review of quanti of spinners and how we're going to be able to quantize these fields. But before we do that, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. Now let's begin with the content. So when we are talking about quantizing our spinner fields, the one thing that we always have to do is refresh ourselves, right? So let's do that. So what we went over back in chapter three was we talked about these left-handed vial spinners and these right-handed vial spinners, right? These are two linearly independent spinners, right? And the, they can be described as having, uh, as just being these little two, uh, two by one matrices. And these guys, and you can make them functions of space and time through this prescription right here. And we talked about this, right? Then we talked about the Dirac spinner. The Dirac spinner was a combination of the vial spinners. And we can make those a function of space and time as well. And that's how we, this is how we did that. Nothing's quantized yet. We're gonna get there. If, so if you remember what our prescription was for quantizing stuff was that we started with the Lagrangian, right? That's classical field theory, Lagrangian. And then from that, we get our conjugate momentum to the solution of our Lagrangian, right? So Lagrangian gave us equations of motion. The equation of motion gave us solutions. The solutions then have, then we were able to get the conjugate momentum to those solutions. Then you take the conjugate momentum and the solution, you up, you essentially apply the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and then that brings us into the realm of quantum physics. And upon the application of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, then we see what the commutation relationships between the annihilator and the com and the, the annihilator operations and the com and um, the creation operations. What, what the relationship between those are essentially. And we're going to do that, right? We're going to do that. We're going to see that the, uh, we're going to see what these uh, solutions look like, and that's what we're going to do in this video. Right? We're going to do this in sort of sort of an interesting way. So I don't think this is really the way I'm going to do it here is really talked about very much on YouTube or anywhere else. But I kind of like it. Anyways, so again, nothing. This isn't new, and what we're going to talk about here also isn't really new, right? So we want to recall that trans that spinners transform in this weird way where uh, they rotate. Uh, the left-handed and the right-handed spinners rotate the same way, right, through this matrix, right? But they boost in different ways, right? So, and this phi in, um, the, this phi here, right, so this is a function of phi, but these here are the parameters that we put into our matrix to get how our left-handed and our right-handed um, spinners 
transform, right? You want, we, we want to recall that fundamentally this, this is what makes spinners spinners. It's how they transform. For every mathematical object we talk about in the universe, vectors transform contravariantly, covectors transform covariantly, right? Tensors tra transform in a combination of covariant and, com and contravariant ways. S uh, and uh, scalars, they don't, they, they transform in a, in a way, the, in the, it's the zero transformation, right? So uh, no matter how you rotate your frame of reference or boost your frame of reference, a scalar is going to remain a scalar, right? 1.1 1. 1 is going to remain 1.1 1. 1, no matter how you change your frame of reference, right? So that's what makes a scalar a scalar. And we, we always will just want to keep this at the back of our in the back of our minds, right? When when we when we start getting into the weeds of uh, quantizing the spinner fields, we always want to keep in the back of our mind that these spinners fundamentally what is making these fields different from other mathematical fields is the way these fields transform. The transformation is what's key, right? You we really, really want to hit that home that the transformation is what is key. Okay, and this, so this is something that we always want to keep in the back of our minds. Okay, and then these spinners have they have sort of an equivalent Minkowski metric to them, right? So insofar that they transform in a unique way, they all there's also a metric between two spinners, right? So how can you quantify the difference, in other words, between two spinners, and one of the ways to do that, right, is to use a metric. And the metric that we use in the spinner space looks like this, right? The Minkowski metric is in space-time, and the spinner metric is in the spinner space, right? Okay. We're going to use A and B for our creation and annihilation uh, Scalar, or, so we used A and B, right? So we, when we had when we talked about complex scalars, right? We used A and B for creation and annihilation operators, right? So that's what we said. That's what I have here. So we use A and B for creation and annihilation scalar fields, complex scalar fields. So we're going to use C and D for spinner fields, okay? Just so we can keep track of things, right? We don't want to we don't want to repeat ourselves too much. Okay, so what we're going to do, so what I've started off by doing is saying, okay, well, this is a solution for an oscillating field, right? We found out that the Dirac equation was an oscillating field, okay? It's related to the Klein gordon equation, and so we're, we're stipulating that this is a general solution. Okay. And you can check it, it, it works. Right? Okay. However, we want this to be unique, right? We don't want it to look exactly like the uh, scalar field. So what are we gonna do? Well, let's insert spinners into this and see what happens, right? So this, so we're gonna insert spinners here. This here is gonna make up, uh, this here is gonna, we're gonna have up and down spinners that this is gonna resemble, and this is also gonna resemble up and down spinners. So we're being a little bit repetitive, but at, at least we've changed things up a little bit now, okay? Let's continue with this logic, right? So, okay, so we haven't really done that much, okay? What we did, right, we said C and D, and we're going to make these things complex, okay, because spinners are complex, and so, so we have C and D. We added spinners in here. Okay, these are the spinners that we, we talked about back in chapter three. We have the same thing right here, but now we're saying, okay, we want to make this complex. All right. So we added these guys, but now what how about so this guy here we want to have, we want to know what the complex field of this field is, or the complex version of this field is. Okay. 
So here is what we originally had. So if we make everything complex, then we have this here, right? So we just, the complex of this, or the conjugate of this is this, the conjugate of this is this, the conjugate of this is this, and the conjugate of this is this. And then everywhere we see an I, we conjugate that as well. And this here is our complex conjugate to our original spinner field. Now you might ask, this, nothing really special happened here. It's not, well, that's true, right? Nothing that special really happened, right? We added spinners on, into our solution, and we're saying, and then we're just saying, okay, this, this is, should work, right? It does work. This is a general solution to an oscillating system, right? We found that spinners oscillate into uh, right-handed and left-handed spinners, right? And the Dirac equation itself is an oscillating equation. It describes oscillation. It describes os oscillative motion. The Lagrangian we saw also sort of gave birth to the Dirac equation. So we know these things oscillate, right? We talked about this before. So this, we know these systems have to oscillate and the solutions to these oscillating systems look like this. This is the most, gen, the most mathematically general we can get by still adding spinners into our solutions, okay? And that's really that for this video, right? I don't want, I don't want to get too deep into this, into each video unless the video, unless I want the, be, the video to be a little bit more self-contained. But as far as this video goes, I'm gonna stop it here and just let you digest this type of logic so that we can hopefully, so that you can hopefully have a better foundation for the next video that's to come. The next few videos that are gonna come is gonna talk about exactly what the what we're dealing with here right and I'll, I'll allude to this right now we are summing over spin states so up and down right we're only, we're only going from one to two so this summation here sums over spin states the integral sums over momentum states okay what does adding the complex conjugate do right because we already had this this we already had this guy here. This guy here is going to look like antiparticles, and we're going to see that. We're going to so essentially what we have. We'll parse this out. We're going to parse this out in the next video. Essentially, what we have is spinners, and then anti-spinners. Right? We're we're going to get as general as we can get. Spinners, anti-spinners. So that's the cut. That's the the that's this and this right spinners and anti-spinners okay and then within these we are creating and annihilating anti-spinners and we're also creating and annihilating spinners that's these guys these coefficients up in here okay what so so we can start thinking okay the, the, here are the independent variables that we need to consider is it an anti-spinner or a spinner is it spin up or spin down? And are we creating or annihilating these things, right? So when we talk about, say, I wanna create a spin up anti-spinner, right? This is the kind, of log the kind of wordage that we wanna start thinking about here when we start thinking about what the general solutions to these things are. Because I think understanding the verbiage a little bit is gonna help us understand what each uh, subscript means here because you can really easily get lost in the weeds and we're going to talk about that in the next video so i'll see you guys there.